Your guest speakers uh, for tonight and tomorrow, it's a really nice, wonderful uh, selection of people who were influenced by Glenn in class and also influenced by him uh, as colleagues. And tonight, our, our two guest speakers are people who were students at Southern Seminary across the way, uh, but also were his colleagues uh, as professors. Our first is Dr. Lloyd Allen. Uh, many of you already know Lloyd. He and his wife Libby and their daughter Claire were members of Crescent Hill. I was, that's about 18, uh, 18, that's right, 1989 to 1992. Uh, Claire has completed an MSW, if you remember her, when she was younger here. She's now a social worker in Massachusetts. And Libby has just retired as the admissions director of McAfee School of Theology in Atlanta. Uh, Lloyd is the Sylvan Hills Chair of Baptist Heritage at uh, the James and Carolyn McAfee School of Theology in Atlanta. He's also a professor of church history and spiritual formation. The title itself tells you how um, Lloyd was influenced by people like Glenn. His interests are Baptist history, spiritual formation, and interfaith work. All three. The, the connections and the inner working here are, 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 you just can't pull them apart. I think it's fair to say that he influenced Glenn, he influenced Bill, and they influenced uh, him. Uh, the material that Bill Thomason did for you in the program is excellent. I hope that you will read everything there. Uh, about Lloyd and all the other speakers. I do want to mention to you that uh, when Lloyd was here as a student, uh, he had come from Alabama, University of Mount Avalo. He was here for three years uh, as a faculty member, but he had been here for the MDiv and the PhD as a student. Uh, just one thing about Lloyd, uh, two things. When he, when he left here, he went to a little place called Bruton Parker College in Mount Vernon, Georgia. He was there for five years and then he came here uh, and served for three years before he left and went to Mississippi College and then came back to Atlanta. Um, I actually applied for the same job that he did here and I guess I was told by Larry McSwain, maybe Larry was just trying to let me down, <laughs> that I came in second to Lloyd. I also was told by somebody when I applied for a job out at Portland named Kate, y'all remember Bill Kate, that I came in second to Lloyd. But what that really means is, is that Lloyd is older than me. <laughs> Lloyd is a great friend of mine. He is a great friend of Glenn's. Uh, his paper is on the wedding of contemplation and friendship in Thomas Merton and Elred of Rivaux, uh, an English Cistercian monk of the 12th century going to focus on soul friendship. Lloyd, in honor of Glenn, we look forward to your address. I am honored to be here. I could not tell you uh, how, what a sacred place this is for us. Uh, how important uh, so many people are, uh, Glenn and so many others for us. And uh, Johnson's prayers, I made a collection of while I was here, his pastoral prayers. I don't know if they ever got published any place. They should be. Uh, and so I'm grateful to be part of uh, anything that honors him and anything that honors Glenn. By the way, how many of you were drawn to contemplative prayer by Glenn Henson? I want hands raised. Glenn, I want you to turn and look. Me too. If you know his story, you know that Thomas Merton was influential in Glenn's spiritual formation. In one way or another, Glenn and Merton have been soul friends to many of us. I say soul friends and not spiritual directors because I know Glenn doesn't like the phrase spiritual directors. I often use it myself 
but I can't say I disagree with Glenn's avoidance of it. Spiritual director has a bit too much of that hierarchical authority and formal therapeutic objectivity still clinging to it for my tastes. I don't like the distance those things create between the spiritual guide and the guided. As I see it, the problem I'm addressing is that too often contemporary spiritual guidance lacks friendship. To make matters worse, if you have friendship, we aren't always sure just what that means. We aren't clear what spiritual friendship really looks like. And if we were clear, we'd still need some basic education in how to become a friend in a healthy way, in a spiritual guidance relationship. Y'all still have the pollen here in Louisville, don't you? This presentation is designed to make a case for putting friendship back into one-to-one -one spiritual guidance by wedding Elred of Raveau's teachings on friendship with Thomas Merton's insights on contemplation, both in the service of spiritual direction. Excuse me, Glenn, for that phrase. I believe doing so, wedding those two, can kindle soul friendships at every level of spiritual guidance, including contemporary formal spiritual direction. In Elred, 1109 to 1167, we will find that true friendship is essential to all Christian spiritual guidance. And in Merton, we will find Christian contemplation helps friends be true. Between them, they bear witness to a balanced guidance rooted in a deep and wide Christian tradition. But there are some difficulties. Uniting friendship and contemplation in the service of contemporary spiritual guidance is not as easy as it might sound. Take friendship, for instance. While it is true that the Gaelic term anamkara or soul friend is very fashionable these days when speaking of spiritual guidance, Two troubling questions persist. The first is this. Is friendship even appropriate between spiritual guides and those they guide? Or is it an obstacle? The second question is, what makes for good friendship anyway? A lack of clarity about the meaning of friendship in such terms as soul friends or spiritual friendship has created many a counterfeit friendship and many a poor guidance relationship. It's dangerous to be friends. Little education on friendship exists. Marriage retreats are common. Maybe we Christians need some friendship retreats. Elred's little treatise, Spiritual Friendship, which Elred Squire calls, quote, in fact, the only complete treatise on the subject of friendship by a Christian in the tradition of the undivided church, end quote, might be a good place to start. Let me tell you what I'm concerned about. Contemporary spiritual guides often consider friendship appropriate only at less sophisticated levels of guidance. They discourage it in more formal settings. Sister Kathleen Flood, a well-known teacher of spiritual directors, uses a table on types of spiritual guides at conferences. As a friend of hers, I have been there where she's used it several times. This table has spiritual friendship on the far left column. It's my left, not yours. On the far left column. And spiritual director on the far right with descriptions under them. Spiritual direction is right next to psychotherapy. The table describes spiritual friendship as informal, unstructured, and reciprocal. It calls spiritual direction one-directional, formal, and intensive. 
My point is that this table places spiritual friendship and spiritual direction at opposite ends of a spectrum. The more intensive the spiritual guidance, the less one can expect to find friendship in the equation. I want to give one more illustration. Margaret Gunther, a well-respected teacher of spiritual direction at New York's General Theological Seminary before she died in 2016, explicitly opposed mixing friendship and spiritual direction. She admits in her book, Holy Listening, that director and directee might develop, quote, a rich spiritual friendship, end quote, but she quickly adds, quote, the friendship can continue, but the directee will need to find a new director, end quote. I once heard her say in private conversation that she'd rather, that she would prefer not so much as to share a cup of coffee with the directee unless they were both in formal spiritual direction session. Do friendship and spiritual guidance mix no better than oil and water? Elred and Merton said no, that friendship and guidance go together like toast and jam. Now, turning to contemplation, friendship and contemplation and the difficulties, I just got to tell you, this isn't in the lecture. By the time I got to trying to write about Merton and contemplation in this paper, I wished I hadn't tried. <laughs> contemplation is almost as vague in content and as varied in usage as friendship is. Who knows the difference between contemplation and meditation or contemplation and mysticism? or infused, converse, uh, infused contemplation and active contemplation. What can you expect if you go to a contemplative retreat? Silence, yoga, guided meditation, finger painting, all of the above, none of the above. Just what is this anyway? It is as prone to misunderstanding as friendship is, contemplation. The word contemplation and its related words, contemplative, contemplate, and mysticism, only Raymond Bailey can understand. <laughs> he wrote a book on it. They carry a multiplicity of meanings. Carl McCollman, a professed lay Cistercian and the best-selling author of the book, The Big Book of Christian Mysticism, The Essential Guide to Contemplative Spirituality. He admits that one has to discern what an author or speaker means by contemplation and its relative words if one is going to understand a lecture on contemplation or its related words. By the way, I think his book title itself makes his point, the big book of mysticism, contemplation. Well, contemplation is Merton's main bailiwick. And so I'll focus on contemplation as I see it in Merton's writings. But Merton writes so much and he changes so often, have mercy on me. And I will speak about particularly how contemplation relates to the true and false self. And I'm not as concerned about misleading you here because Raymond Bailey is going to speak to that in his lecture. Now, on to the two figures that I trust can help us clarify these difficulties of friendship and contemplation as related to spiritual guidance. Elred of Raveau, Thomas Merton, they arrived at the wedding of friendship and contemplation through different doors. Elred's door was marked sociable, and Merton's door reads solitary. Elred was formed in the old Saxon Celtic Christian tradition. He imbibed it with his mother's milk. Elred's father and grandfather and great-grandfather were married priests 
His great-grandfather was shrine-bearer at the cult of St. Cuthbert in Durham. And Cuthbert was the last in a long line of Celtic saints stretching back from Lindisfarne to Iona to St. Patrick's, Ireland. And Elred knew all their stories. At the age of 14, he was fostered into the house of King David I of Scotland. He left the king's court and joined the brand new Cistercian Monastery at Riveau in 1134. The newfangled French and Roman Catholic style monasticism. He died there in 1134. He died there as abbot in 1167. Alred's religious life and writings bridge the old Celtic Catholic heritage and the newly dominant French and Roman style of his time. But everywhere he went, Elred traveled the crowded way of community. Everything we know about him suggests an outgoing personality with deep attachment to many friends. This isn't in there either, but think Bill Leonard. In the prologue to Spiritual Friendship, which is written, by the way, as three conversations between friends, Elred and his friends, Elred reminisces in that text, quote, when I was still a boy at school, the charms of my companions gave me the greatest pleasure. Nothing seemed sweeter to me, nothing more pleasant, nothing more valuable than to love and to be loved. As an adult, walking Riveau's grounds from one little group of monks to another, he writes, I marveled as though walking among the pleasures of paradise, enjoying the leaves, flowers, and fruits of each single tree. I found not one brother in that whole multitude whom I did not love, and by whom I did not think I was loved in return. Indeed, I felt as though my spirit had been poured out into all of them, and their affection had been transplanted in me. In his last illness, his biographer says that anywhere from 12 to 30 of Elred's monkish friends surrounded his deathbed at any one time, day or night, and that when he was awake and able, he eagerly talked to them of God, charity, and the peace of contemplation. Thomas Merton writes a history of St. Elred and the Cistercians, and in it he describes Elred's spirituality this way. The spirituality of St. Elred is the spirituality of a complete and uncompromising Cenobite, which means a monk in community. It is social and communal down to its very roots. By his very nurture, Elred was predisposed to love people and to love company. And when God's grace began to work on Elred to turn him into a contemplative, it by no means turned him into a solitary. That was not Elred's vocation, says Merton. But it was Merton's vocation. If Elred took the crowded road of community, Thomas Merton sought the solitary path of the hermit. He wrote, I have always felt an attraction to the life of perfect solitude. Now, if you know anything about the life of Merton, this may sound like an exaggeration. Merton's familiarity with the ways of the world is clear in his autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain. Before Merton entered Gethsemane Monastery in 1941, he lived the high life of an elite intellectual college student, drinking and smoking heavily while frequenting bars and jazz clubs at all hours and enjoying the company of women, one of whom bore his child. And after his conversion as a monk, 
He became an internationally celebrated religious author and host at Gethsemane to numerous well-known personages, including our own Glenn Henson. Merton wrote so many letters that several books of his letters have been published. But in the midst of all, his was a hermit's soul seeking solitude. Merton went to Gethsemane Monastery in Kentucky, seeking separation from the world and silence in solitude. He found it hard to come by there because the monastery was overcrowded. A desire gradually awakened in him to follow the eremitical, the hermit way, rather than the cenobitic communal way of the Cistercian Trappists. And through the years, Merton entertained frequent inclinations to transfer to one order, to another order more open to the hermit's life. He looked at the Carthusians, and he was attracted to the Camaldolis. He gradually moved, literally, toward greater solitude on Gethsemane's grounds. First, he gained permission to write alone in a room in the main buildings. Then he lived in a private cell for, pri for health reasons. Next, he spent certain hours a day in solitude in a vacant tool shed. And in 1960, he went to a new cinder block cottage as a part-time hermit. In 1965, he at last gained permission to live in that cottage full-time as a hermit, the first in Cistercian life in centuries. And unlike Elred, Merton the hermit died alone. I shouldn't overemphasize the differences, however. Elred and Merton may have arrived at the wedding of friendship and contemplation through different doors, but they started from the same place. Though separated by 4,000 miles and 800 years, they were both Cistercian monks formed as contemplatives in that tradition. Contemplation gave them an experiential wisdom of a unity existing in the heart of all things. Merton wrote about Elred's Cistercians in words Merton had personal knowledge of. Quote, it was in the fire of contemplation and in the intimate union of love that they, Elred's monks, had learned the secrets of the heart of God. One of those secrets was this universal unity by love present in all creation. And that is critical for understanding the union of friendship and contemplation in the spiritual guidance understood by Elred and Merton. In their contemplation, they learned that God poured God's self out to make creation and to sustain it by God's constant presence within all things. Elred, of course, expressed this foundational union of God with all things through his old Saxon Celtic sensibilities. Before Christianity came, pre-Christian Celts had believed all matter intertwines with spiritual reality. You might imagine to yourself a Celtic knot, unending, interwoven. They saw spirit mingle in matter, in sacred groves, springs of water, the sea, the sky, animals, the sun, in short, in all creation. Kick a stone, stir a wing, the old saying goes. And it was only a short step for Celts when they became Christian to seeing the incarnate God intertwined in all things. Elred puts in his writing about puts in his writings about what draws friend to friend a mystical vision of God within all creation drawing everything stones trees playful animals angelic hosts 
and humans into unity by a longing for one another that is founded in Christ's presence in every natural thing. God, unseen, is present in all things as love, seeking love, until we are all drawn to one in Christ. And Merton agreed. He decided early on that, quote, the only way to live was to live in a world that was charged with the presence and reality of God. Ever the polymath, he drew from a variety of sources to speak of this universal unity, including philosophical, aesthetic, Eastern Orthodox, and non-Christian Eastern religions, as well as psychology, literary theory, and yes, Celtic sources. A recent book is about Merton's digging into the Celtic way of understanding. I find his use of a philosophical understanding of God as being, capital B, being, most useful for my purposes today. Around the time of his conversion, Merton chanced upon a definition of God as capital B being in a book by philosopher Etienne Gilson. This, quote, big concept, end quote, that he found, Merson, Merton wrote, quote, was to revolutionize my whole life. What's the concept? That God was capital B, being itself, not a being, or even abstract being in general, but, quote, concrete and real, infinite being who transcends all possible conceptions, end quote. God is existence. All that exists must necessarily exist grounded in God, who is independent of but not separate from any particular being. God's being is the foundation reality present in all lowercase beings, holding us in existence and in unity with one another. All lowercase beings exist in the ground of God's capital B being, which is love, as trees live rooted in the soil. Two conclusions follow. One, creation cannot stand without God's loving, constant presence. Two, God cannot stand to be separated from creation. Ain't love grand. Elred and Merton each experience this unity and diversity, but sociable Elred sees the community uni unity first. As in that illustration I gave above, the one about unity drawing from rocks to angelic hosts all together as one. Now, solitary Merton is drawn more to the unalterable individuality of each thing being unified in the whole. Merton writes, no two things are created exactly alike, end quote. And he says God planned it that way and that this uniqueness of form and characteristics is the imprint of God's reality in every separate being. A tree, Merton explains, gives glory to God by being a tree. It is expressing an idea which is in God and which is not distinct from the essence of God, for God is one. And therefore, a tree imitates God by being a tree. End quote. Now, not a tree as a replica of a universal type or a facsimile of some perfect ideal, but a only one of its kind tree, existing with a thisness, resting in the God who conceived it and gives it being. Here, now. The more any particular being is true to its individual God-given inscape, 
That's a word Merton borrowed from Gerard Manley Hopkins. The more it is like God, and therefore, the more it will glorify God. To quote Hopkins on that point, this world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. For humans, for the rest of creation, unity with God depends on being one's unique, particular self. With the additional twist that unlike other beings, humans have the freedom given them in the image of God to choose between what God intended them to be or not. We are at liberty to be real or to be unreal, says Merton, and you make that call. Now on to friendship. For Elred, friendship is one way love creates unity in community and thus gives that glory to God. For Merton, friendship depends on choosing to be your true self so you can love your friends rightly in this harmonious unity. And contemplation is the royal road awakening our true selves. Merton said there are two ways to love your neighbor. Love, one is loving God in others. The other is loving others in God. Elrud represents the first, loving God in others. Merton represents the second, loving others in God. Compare Elrid loving God in others as he walked among those friends in that quote I gave above. Compare that with the famous epiphany of Merton at Fourth and Walnut here in Louisville, where he was granted a vision of the unity of humanity in God. My source for this is the historical marker that stands at that spot. Just a little ways from here. It reads in part, Merton was, quote, suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all these people, end quote. He found them, quote, walking around shining like the sun, end quote. Then it was as if, Merton continues, as if I suddenly saw the core of their reality, the person each one is in God's eyes. Notice that unlike Elred's experience of human unity among his beloved friends, Merton the solitary had his extraordinary contemplative vision in a crowd, yes, but a crowd of complete strangers. He was graced to love others in God. For Elred, friendship is the selfless love of God coming to expression in the affectionate attachment of one person for another. The second of the three divisions of his masterpiece, Spiritual Friendship, is an exploration of friendship as a means to the love and knowledge of God. The final goal of spiritual or Christian or true friendship, all the same to Elred. The final goal is to love God in one another so that the beloved community becomes more of a reality on this earth. Yes, God, Elred admits, is present in every human encounter, uniting us in love with everybody, even our enemies, but authentic friendship brings that truth to acute awareness, an awareness that, God willing, may spread from friend to friend until the whole community benefits. It is one way that God is drawing all creation to God's self, 
by being friends with one another, we are made into friends of God. Jesus said, I call you friends. The very opening words in Elred's masterpiece, Spiritual Friendship, are said to one of his friends, Ivo, who has come to him and asked if he can have a little private conversation with the abbot. Elred says, quote, Ivo, you and I are here, and I hope that Christ is between us as a third. Those words are followed by, quote, Yes, Ivo, most beloved, open your heart now and pour out whatever you please into the ears of a friend. For where true friendship exists, Christ is already present. But here lies the rub. Not all friendship is spiritual friendship. Not true friendship. Alred acknowledges other kinds of friendship exist. The two most common, he writes about, are worldly friendships and carnal friendships. Worldly friendship, quote, changes with fortune and follows money. Carnal, also called particular friendship, begins with sensual attraction and begins with getting pleasure from one another. It's not necessarily sexual. But neither of these is sinful in itself. It's sinful when it becomes selfish. Elred counsel even that these lesser friendships can lead to deeper ones. But he also recognized that friendship is the most potentially dangerous of all affections. He spent book three of spiritual friendship giving practical advice on how to choose friends and preserve friendships. He advised things like, test your new friends by avoiding ever flattering them. Or tell only small confidences and then keep your ears open to see if you hear those someplace else before you share deeper. But at this point, I need to call Thomas Merton back into this conversation. Though Elred is unexcelled at describing true friendship and at advising how to choose friends, we need Merton to help us how, know how to become a friend. Merton calls on us to befriend our true selves so we can be a real friend to others. He writes, quote, if we love ourselves in the wrong way, we become incapable of loving anyone else, end quote. The unity God calls us to is lost, for, quote, we are not capable of union with one another on the deepest level until the inner self in each of us is sufficiently awakened to confront the inmost spirit of the other, end quote. False selves do not make fast friends. In simple terms, the true self is who we are. The false self is who we think we are. And contemplation is how you tell the difference. The true self is the inscape, the thisness within every person. In James Martin's helpful phrase, the true self is the self in you that fits perfectly with, quote, God's conception of yourself. And Merton wrote, what God wants of me is myself. The true self is that self God wants. And only you can be yourself before God. For the incarnation is God's coming to dwell in humanity, making the image of God clear to us in Christ likeness. The deeper our knowledge of our true self, the deeper our knowledge of God, made in the image of God, which is Christ incarnate. The true self is Christ in us, the hope of glory, if we could just be ourselves. The false self is who we think we are. It is who we believe we must strive to be in order to be somebody. It is a mask 
Merton says, created from what we or others tell us we are or should be. The false self believes identity is made up of what is found outside itself. And this is Merton's list. What is found outside ourself, the pleasures, experiences, power, honor, knowledge, acquisitions, respect and love or fear gained from other people. It is all we draw around ourselves like Adam and Eve's fig leaves to hide from our nakedness and to make us look presentable. In seeking for itself outside itself, the false self is actually fleeing from the true self, which abides within us, hidden in God. If we center our lives on the false self, we die when these illusions die, bowing to an idol that is hollow, that is nothing. Now, the false self may not be evil in itself, but it is always unreal. For our real identity is already present within us, rooted in union with God alone. We only have to awaken to it. But the awakening feels like death, for it is death. The death of the false self, which we're holding on to as if it were life itself. According to Merton, this awakening comes by contemplation. Quote, contemplation is the greater and more precious gift for it enables us to see and understand the work God wants done, end quote. Contemplation is seeing things as they are in themselves, being aware of their inscape, if not comprehending all that it is. And it requires silence and solitude without reasoning. Discursive reasoning separates the reasoner by at least one remove from the object being reasoned about. It is a seeing, contemplation is a seeing that does not distort what is seen for the false self's sake. A tree, for instance, is not there to cut down for profit or even bring pleasure by its beauty in contemplation. Contemplation is letting things be what they are. Like a child seeing a butterfly for the first time without even having a name or a purpose for what it rejoices in. It is making a sacred space to listen to the silence of God within all of us, within ourselves, and within all things, bringing us into being. Merton writes in his journal of birds waking at dawn, quote, when the father in silence opens their eyes and they speak to him, wondering if it is time to be. And he tells them, yes. Contemplation is the solitary aloneness, not loneliness, without and within for awareness of our being loved and upheld in God's being. Now, if this sounds too difficult to do, or too hard to understand, it is. The Christian contemplative gives up trying to do and gives up trying to understand in order to love and love what God loves. Merton admits now that the great majority of Christians will never become pure contemplatives in this life. But he suggests the graces of the deep interior life are possible for what he calls, quote, masked contemplatives, end quote. Here is Glenn Henson's advice to us would-be masked contemplatives. Quote, the place to begin, I believe, is with contemplation until we begin to rediscover ourselves in relationship to the capital S, self, God, to restore our relation to the ground of being, 
there's little hope that we can reassess our activities and begin to pour meaning into them. First priority must, given, must be given to the one thing needful, or better, the one who is needful. And then one may begin to see what should be done about activities." End quote. After all, contemplation is not a practice. It is an attitude. It is a letting go of the faults and a readiness to have our eyes opened at the dawning of awareness. Then out of that awareness, we can be our true selves in the world, loved and loving others as God's conception of us becomes who we are. And then and only then, are we ready to be friends with ourselves, with God, and with others? So in any healthy relationship between Christians, friendship is desirable, for God desires us to be friends. And this includes the relationship of director to directee, for God is there as well, desiring unity. Both Elred and of Riveau and Thomas Merton were spiritual directors of a sort who were friends with their directees. Their contemplative wisdom freed them to be their true selves, free to do what God willed them to do as spiritual guides, free to be with the other and allow the other to remain free and beloved. Janet Ruffing points out that friendship in spiritual direction doesn't necessarily exclude differenti differentiation of roles but it always includes a mutuality of affection between those who hold certain roles. Doug Weaver called him Dr. Henson for a long time. Doesn't mean they weren't friends. The director Merton writes in his book, Spiritual Direction and Meditation, Merton says, the director is not to be regarded as a magical machine for solving cases and declaring the holy will of God beyond all hope of appeal, but is to be a trusted friend who in an atmosphere of sympathetic understanding helps and strengthens us in our groping efforts to correspond with the grace of the Holy Spirit. And Merton calls ordinary spiritual direction a friendly, sincere, and informal conversation on a basis of personal intimacy, where the best the directee can do is, quote, bring the director into contact with our real self as best we can, and not fear to let the director see what is false in our false self, end quote. So in this wedding of friendship and contemplation, Reality is revealed within a soul friendship, and reality is always rooted in love. Else how could the director, the directee, and Christ make a trinity of friendship? Thank you.